Hey, this is Huck. Subscribe to Thorin's YouTube channel. And then one of my favorite players, but sadly, I have a thing, Artos, I don't know about you, but I actually do really love Kong players because once I know they're Kongs, that in itself, it's almost like, I must be on some like Hellraiser shit where like pleasure becomes pain or something. But like <laughs> somehow the fact that they're so tortured makes it somehow more like bittersweet that they lose. And I almost, like my joke is like my, my favorite games to watch are the Kong players when he wins. My second favorite is when he loses. That's the joke I always say. <laughs> Whereas nobody's supposed to hate it when your favorite player loses. So if you know, you know I'm going to talk about now, the ultimate Kong of all Kongs is obviously Sue, the Zerg mm -hmm. player. Like I remember yeah. Stu Chu, the guy who was like, one of my little protégés who was doing a lot of great articles back in the day. He once described it to me the best way. He just said, like, this guy was the best StarCraft player in the world for, like, maybe, like, two years, except for the finals day of Code S and GSL. Like, every other day, he was the best. If you ever look, right, he would even, like, lose to someone in a the final, then beat that guy in the semis or the quarters next time. He'd be like, right, finally, he's going to win this one now. And he was in, mm -hmm. if people don't know, he was in so many GSL finals. It was ridiculous. How, how do you explain this guy's career? Because it, it, I, I've never seen a player where they didn't win the big GSL, but it's like they almost should be on an all-time list anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. That's actually, that's really sad. Uh, it, it, it's actually almost perfect what, what Stuccio said, where he is he was basically the best player in the world because no one has ever quite done what he did. Like, I guess at this point, you just just start giving everything over to Maru, but like Sue lost in the finals of GSL Coda six times. Only Maru now has even gotten there that many times. It's like, oh, that's, that's ridiculous. That's a, yeah. That's a crazy stat. Like, it what is. are, <laughs> what, and he didn't just get second place there. He got second place in some international events. He got second place at the Bl BlizzCon World Championships. Like, the guy would make it to the finals, like, every time, make everyone look bad and then just lose in the finals. And it's really, I, it had, like things went wrong at first. Like, I remember some of his early ones, like against Zest, like, he had it. And then he kind of threw just slightly. He also had a lot wrong. of close losses. Yeah, he didn't just get smashed. Yeah. He had a lot of like four twos, right. four threes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And like there were ones like that, but I think eventually something got into his mind where, you know, if that stuff happens too long, that can mess with you. That can absolutely mess with you and destroy your psychology, uh, break your mental, as they say in Korea. It's there has to be some of that there because there is no way that every player that beat him was better than him. There's no way. There's no chance. A lot of these people that beat him never even made it back to the finals. Yes. Like they were one hit wonders. Like, like Gumiho was one of the guys who, who, I mean, Gumiho's great. I love Gumiho, but <laughs> sure. Sue was better than Gumiho. He yes. was better than Gumiho and then he lost. So it's, it's like a, a very sad journey in a lot of ways, but he's really legendary and stands out for what it was. He is the ultimate Kong. People talk about yellow. No, Sue is more. Like, and there's been other people that have gotten like insane amounts of second places, but you really got to give it to Sue. He gets the first place as far as second places go. <laughs> the, cru the cruelest of ironies, of course. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Another player, you referenced him already. Obviously, the Terran player of this era was, of course, Maru, who had the amazing storyline where in some ways he was almost like the Flash of StarCraft 2, right? He came along as like the young kid and you're like... Someone check his passport. How old is this guy? But then he just mm. never stopped losing, right? He just kept winning. Although I will say the interesting thing I would also ask about is it felt like towards the end, maybe the weight of trying to become the greatest player ever got to him a little bit. What would you say about Maru's career? Yeah, yeah. So Maru is kind of funny. Like he started as a little kid. He was in season one or two of GSL. Uh, so like he's been around since the beginning. Really, really young, cute little tiny kid. And it took him a while, but... Like, as soon as Kespa switched over, they picked him up. Like, everyone could tell this kid has insane talent. Better, He does better and better and better and better. And literally, my last cast for GSL was that fifth championship. He finally did what MVP barely didn't do, which is win that G5L uh, trophy. Like, he won five GSL code S's, which is insane. That is that is just absolutely crazy that he has won that many. Um, it's... He is by far the best uh, Terran player ever, I would say. It's like not even close. He's actually a lot like Flash in that regard, where other Terrans, there's like innovation is fantastic. TY is fantastic. You know, Byun had his his time. Uh, and, you know, there's some other ones you could talk about and stuff, but like Maru really is a step above. And when you watch his play, you can see it too. He's what the way I like to describe Maru is like, Two different things. First off, he's got the best micro, macro, multitasking and strategy in the world. And then also, like, when you're playing against Maru, if he's ahead of you, you're already dead. If he's equal to you, then 
he's ahead. And if he's behind, he's equal. Like it, that's how you have to commentate him because he doesn't work like other people in situations. Like I, I'm normally very good at calling like where the players are in response, uh, in comparison to each other. But with Maru, you can't do that because he's just such another level from other Terrans. Like other people just cannot do what he can do. So he just makes the game look different. Uh, I would say the one big blemish on Maru's record though, is he doesn't really win internationally. Yes, like if he true. could win, if he could win a world championship, I think you probably have to switch the goat title over to him. Right. It's like right now, the only people you can really argue it for would be like rogue, Cyril Maru. And with Maru, it's like hard because yeah, he, he has so many GSLs and that's kind of the prestigious tournament, but he just never really wins overseas. And that's, that's like a big hanging point for him, I think. And then obviously the Zerg play, you referenced him already, who did what Sue promised to do, but didn't manage to, was of course Rogue. This was the guy where, I mean, if you were waiting again for the Zerg to finally have like the true champion that could dominate, not just the early days like this, this was the player, right? Yeah, yeah. Rogue actually, like if you go by the standards that they named Bonjwas in StarCraft 1, Rogue actually would have had Bonjwas status because he won like four premier tournaments in a row on his run through the world championship. Like he had... Like he won GSL and then he also had to win like, I, I forget, it was like Super Tournament and like IEM Shanghai or something. He did, won both of those and, th and that like got him into the World Championships. Then he won the World Championships and it was like, holy God, he just won like four tournaments in a row to become the World Champion where he wasn't going to have enough points otherwise. Uh, and at this point, like he's he's won like three GSLs against the strongest people possible. He, I mean, he's he's a killer everywhere. Like he he wins international tournaments like it's absolutely nothing. Uh, I, I feel like the only person that really has ever given him true trouble because he falls out every now and then, too. Like, there's something about Rogue. He's like one of these guys that I think might be too good and doesn't keep up the practice or something after he wins championships. A lot of times he'll just fall out of the next tournament early. But yeah, it, it seems like only Cyril is the only thing in his path of being the best. But now that Rogue has retired to go to the military, it's like, well, <laughs> I don't know if he's going to be able to hold on with Maru and Cyril still playing so strongly. What did he do with Zerg that allowed him to have this dominance? Where, as we say, other people like either had like the longevity, but they didn't have the championships in the same way he did. Yeah, I think he had uh, the best understanding of the late game that anyone's ever had, uh, at least for the period. I mean, obviously everyone's learned from what he did at that time, but he got so good after Hive Tech, basically, like when, when he actually lived towards the end, he became unbelievable like he knew exactly how to utilize every portion of that late game to destroy people uh and also another another aspect of him is he was very good at abusing anything that could be abused like for instance a lot of his championships were won when nidus worm people weren't expecting it and he's like okay i have these nidus rushes bam go uh and he was very willing this is something i've definitely noticed from the the greatest championships there's people that win championships by playing safe, methodical, nice play like rain and stats. And I actually respect those guys. It, like, that's how I like to see Starcraft. But like the super mega giga champions are the guys who actually will take like some insane risks and do some crazy cheeses like MVP, Maru, Rogue. These guys, the, it'll be like game seven and be like, okay, I'm doing it all in, you know, and they'll just go for it. And it's like, okay, this is, they're built a little bit different. Like they're absolutely willing to do something that's 50% here because they think this is their best chance or something like that. So you referenced several earlier and here's the funny thing I will say as an outsider, I've always like looked who wins GSL and watch like the odd final and stuff because like, I'm in my role as esports and so on. I want to know, like, again, be able to chop it up with people and talk shop when they know the game, but I've never followed it as closely as I did when it was the biggest game in the world and everyone loved it, et cetera. So one thing I have to say that really shocked me about the several story is I was obviously mainly watching GSL and thinking, right. I've got the, I've, I already learned from Monty and you guys, like I've got the Korean elitism down. Korea is always the best. GSL is the real world championship. Yeah. And even if they call BlizzCon world champion, it's, it's just like, for sure, that's for the cameras. It's really about mm -hmm. winning core deaths, of course. That's the pinnacle, right? So because I was keeping in touch with this, I had all these friends of mine who used to be Western StarCraft 2 fans who were telling me, no, you've got to check out this Serral guy. He's the shit, dude. He's the best player. And I was looking and I was going, he's winning like DreamHack, mate. Let, look, I know the Koreans are there, but it's a weekend tournament. They fly over, you know, mm -hmm. maybe they didn't maybe that he catches them off guard and for, I was in denial for so long that this guy could be the best right but the problem is you referenced it with the Maru one so then they'd have the international tournament Maru and all the Koreans would fly over I'm like right now you guys are going to fucking learn 
what it's <laughs> like to be a GSL yeah. coordinator. And obviously, we know the story. He won bloody nearly all the championships, including beating these guys head to head, like in the biggest matches, sometimes just straight out played them. Now, there is the angle, which is obviously his weird idiosyncrasy, is that he never has tried to be the court S player. He doesn't care about living in Korea. He's just some weird Finnish guy that's just happy to just dust everyone off if they come to the West. So who is this guy and what was he good at? Like, how did he, how did he do it? It feels like this is the one where you can make all the excuses for like Koreans going down in level. Like he's just matched the absolute best Koreans though. And he has beaten the best Koreans. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no, there's no flaw here. There's no trick. It's, and that's always what it's been with non-Koreans against yes. Koreans. When you get a champion, it's like, you'll have some great performances from some of the non-Koreans where they'll actually end up taking a tournament or something. But those were all semi flukish, right? Like those, those guys couldn't stand up. Uh, to the test of time, Sarrell is legitimately probably the best player in the world right now. Like, it, I mean, it's it's him or Maru a hundred percent. It's been all off a few years now as well, right? It's been quite a few years yeah. they've been sort of going back and forth, right? Oh, totally. Like, I mean, right now, Sarrell just maintains. Like, he stays up on top. Like, he gets the highest ladder scores. You know, he he does. He, he wins more tournaments than basically anyone. Now, the European tournaments overall are a little bit weaker than GSL, sure. But whenever he meets up with the Koreans, it's he's not afraid of them. It's more like they're afraid of him. Like, they know that he is good enough to absolutely beat everybody. And the thing is, he's just, he's incredibly smart with his play. He's just, he's got the full package. He's absolutely good at everything. He knows what to do at all moments. His macro, his micro, it's just all completely on point. And he's so like calm and methodical with his decision making, which is something I've never really seen with a foreigner of that level, right? Like it's normally something will go wrong. Like the, the Koreans will throw some wrench into the gears. Like that's actually, they talk about it. it that's how you deal with foreigners is you just kind of attack them early and they, right. they'll screw something up and then you take control and take advantage of that. That doesn't happen with Sarah. Like he's, he is just such a complete monster. It's insane. And it's it's like what we've been wishing for and dreaming of for 20 years. Yes. Like we've always wanted something like that. And you know, the thing is when they when they did the region locking, like there was a lot of talk about that. And would we have Sarah without that though? I don't know. Like I think that that probably made Sarah. Like I think that's a that's a big part of it, is that there was that region locking. He had the time to actually grow and develop himself as a player. And I, the thing is, we never had one before the region locking and then region locking came along and we got one and we, you know, we kind of got some others too, right? Like Rainer, you know, he, he rose up to the top as well, was a world champion. Uh, so yeah, it, I mean, Cyril is just, he's, he's so legit and his name really is there. It, like there's arguments to be made, I think, between Rogue, Cyril and Maru for the GOAT. And I think in the next year or two, we're going to know who it is because Maru and Cyril are still playing and Rogue went to the military. So the thing is, how is anyone ever going to catch these guys? They're just so far ahead of everyone else. Yeah, and as you say, the, obviously the interesting angle is everyone who's in the GOAT conversation has their own like knock against them as well. So Maru didn't get the national championships role, could just wash out of the next tournament, but then just go, All right, better start practicing, come back and win the next GSL. And obviously for Serral, he didn't do yeah. the Korean Cordes. He didn't go there like the others. So if people don't know, back in the day when it was like Stefano and Naniwa, Stefano's whole game, because he was the rock and roll star, was to win the weekend tournament. He would have, ne- I mean, he did like one or two, so he would have never made it through Cordes. Like it's a month long, mm. guys. And then Nani- Anyway, look, he was a mate of mine. I'll tell you straight up. 99% of our conversations were about mentality, mate. Like he had all the skills and he was a yeah. nutcase. He'd even admitted himself. So this is the guy with the complete package. So the question is this, do you, should he have gone and tried at least to do a core Is that, would that have been your dream to at least see if he could have done it? Everyone wants him to a- everyone. And he's been asked it so many times. And the thing is like, he, I, I guess he doesn't have anything to prove. It's, for a long time, that's what I would say about him. It's like, well, guys, Rogue wins everywhere. Like, he's the GOAT. But Cyril, at this point, has won so many times against the top Korean players on LAN that it's hard to hold Code S against him. But I would say, like, I think if this if this particular argument mattered to him, if he just tried Code S, like, three times, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he won one. <laughs> like, he is that level. I know. Like, he can do it. Absolutely. He can beat everybody. Uh, but Code S is a different type of format. There's a lot more preparation for every single match, which uh, makes it a little bit harder on Zerg compared to weekend tournaments. That's that's kind of like a generally accepted thing that like Terran likes to prepare and Zerg is a little bit more reactive so they can kind of maybe absorb more different things that occur 
in a quickly uh, fast paced uh, like weekend tournament. So that's like there are these little arguments against Cyril, but it's just it, with the amount that he's won, his name is still there for sure. One thing I thought was fun was the way you said that, like, they even have sort of, like, almost like a derogatory way among Koreans of being like, look, all you do against the foreigners is just, like, fuck around with them a little bit, do something weird in, like, the mid-game. It'll, it'll break and not know what's happening, and it, you win the game. Because if people don't know, Koreans, look, I know on camera they all do the, you know, cheer for me and I'll show a nice game. They're ruthless. They're ruthless amongst each <laughs> other. Like, they will destroy each other in practice games, like, a hundred in a row if they can, and get, that guy will get kicked out the fucking team. They're not, like, they're not, when it comes to competition, these guys are killers. So what I'll say is this, it's very very rare, obviously, ever in the history of esports in a game where Koreans really tried that you ever had a Western figure that could be as good or better. So normally, like, for example, I can tell you in League of Legends when Koreans were the absolute best, they would even do stuff like in game one of, like, the series, they would sort of, like, give you a few of your best picks just to see, like, right, I'm going to win anyway, but let's just see, like, what you're really good at, and then I'll just make sure you don't get that for the rest of the series. Like, it's out at that point. So they had, like, cynical strategies, and I know, for example, when Nanawa was in Korea, I know he thinks it's a conspiracy theory, and, like, maybe he was a little bit I think it's true. Back then, people would absolutely, because it was about Korea winning against the West, they would absolutely like leak strats from people he was practicing with. And that's one of the ways they could break him is if you, in game one, the guy perfectly scouts some builds you did or just like the mm. build on a counter. Th then if you're not a worse especially you're going to go up to the moon, aren't you? you your head's going to be blown off steam coming out your ears. So like, the question is this, right? What did Koreans make of Serral then? It must have just been like, who, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it kind of was. It was funny seeing uh, a bunch of the interviews and stuff because it, they they started getting asked more and more and more about him. And there's just, I mean, there's a level of respect. There's a level of fear there. They they just know that it's like, no, this there is someone that's completely legitimate, you know, from Europe that, that can absolutely beat everyone, outplay everybody. Like, the guy understands the game better than them. And this has just never happened. Like, StarCraft is 24 years old. It's never happened, right? Except like maybe year one with Gur, right? But that's year one. That doesn't really, that's not real professional StarCraft yes. since the the invention of Star Leagues, basically, let's call it. Let's call that era StarCraft, professional StarCraft. We literally just never had anyone outside of Korea be able to do things like this. So it's like, and especially when you're that good, it's not just a single championship. It's not just two championships. It's a lot of championships that are being taken. It, it, I mean, there's more tournaments in StarCraft 2 than there ever was really yearly in StarCraft 1. So it's hard to draw exact parallels, but it is it is like he is kind of like one of those bourgeois esque figures where it's like, yeah, no, this guy is literally just one of the best that there is. Right, I, I promised it earlier, but now is going to be the part where if, like that a lot of that obviously was like the new school fans learn the game, sit mm. by the fireside while our horses regales you. Now it's for if you're the old school fan and you're checking back in. Like I thought, StarCraft died. Like I'm, <laughs> I didn't think it died. What I thought right was the classic story that those of us in the industry had was because streaming hadn't exploded back then and games like League of Legends hadn't taken over the whole world, esports was just a smaller space so it was the big fish in the small pond and to me it just stayed like a similar size like people will know the viewership was still good and the tournaments were still good and the other games just went up in viewership and up in money and games like League of Legends just went out of the universe and kind of the biggest to this day. But I have to say, I I thought because I've heard about the circuit and I saw like obviously a lot of the players died off, right? there's two factors I've noticed. One is another thing that's beautiful if you love a game and you don't care about it being the most popular is yeah a lot of the casuals will stop playing but the absolute best players especially Koreans they will play till the ends of the earth people will know mm. some of the stories some of the great champions in Starcraft 2 guys still play now they're just in some tiny team you've never heard of or in China or something and they're just in some some back room just still playing like trying to get back to the top and they're never going to make it but god bless them what an amazing mentality right and so if people don't know when you get a game that this this scene shrinks down yeah in theory it's not as exciting for the world championship but it means that like in some ways it can be harder to win GSL Cordes because you're playing like the same guys and they've all won it and now you have to beat them and they're all like you say they're all racing for who gets the fifth one and who gets the fourth. it actually becomes at the top level and it's more condensed even harder you can't get like an easy bracket what's an easy bracket if you play three GSL champions on your yeah. way to the final and so the thing about the latter day that shocked me when I looked up recently was I was looking up the prize money and what the fuck dude if you take the 5v5 games like Counter-Strike and League of Legends and you divide by five 
Do you know StarCraft 2 has had more prize money than these games do? Like, the total right now for my native game of uh, CSGO is $140 million. So divide by five, obviously less than 30 there. If you go to League of Legends, that has $95 million. So divide by five, do it again. StarCraft 2 is at $38 million. It is a 1v1 game, guys. And that means when you go and look, if you ever click that list, you are going to be shocked if you are a Western fan from the old days. Because people who you would think are like an also-run footnote, like Major... Dude, they're on the list. They won like like a million dollars or something over there. Chris, like this is a, give give me the give me the update for you. When everyone says StarCraft Two died, so I would say it's around like 2014 or something. It's around basically like Wings of Liberty went out. We got in the next game, and then like mm. the, the expansions. People claim it's diminishing returns, but like I say, in, it changed as a scene. But in some ways, it, it continued. Right? It's still an enormous game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, like it, it doesn't get the viewership that it did at its peaks or anything like that. Like certainly not, but. Uh, we still have like a lot of pro tournaments. Honestly, the whole dead game thing is so it's the thing is I've been around since the beginning. I remember the first time I saw someone say Starcraft was dead. It was 2001. Okay. With Brood War. Someone <laughs> okay. said in 2001 that okay. Brood War was dead. Dude, I st it, like we still have a pro scene in Brood War. It's Starcraft yes. 2. Absolutely. Tons of tournaments. Way more than Brood War. Uh, it's 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 crazy. Uh, but yeah, it, it maintains like there's still a solid base of streamers. There's tournaments consistently. And there's like a lot of smaller tournaments that kind of like fill in the gaps because the bigger tournaments like get slightly downsized. You know, over time, they do go down a little bit. Uh, and yeah, maybe the, there's still like a, a good amount of players, but the Korean scene certainly has shrunk. There's no real new players. Like yes. in the past few years, we've had like, I would say in the past three years, maybe we had one new GSL code S player from the Koreans. Right. So that's like not, that's not the, the latter scene in Korea is not very healthy. The, the pro scene is mostly just old guys, but people are coming back from the military and rejoining the pro scene. So it's basically the same group of guys that we had almost all along, which in some ways is making it really awesome. It actually kind of reminds me of uh, when many, many years ago, like checking out Warcraft three tournaments where it's like you see the the 16 player bracket and you're like, I know every single one of these yes, guys. They're all, all legendary. the classic names. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what like GSL is at this point where you like you said, it, like we'll have a group and it's like, OK, all four of these guys are former championships. In fact, we have seven championships total one in this group. So that's like pretty insane. And the like with Taste I having been there for so long, like we have infinity stories about everyone that plays at this point. Right. And it's just it's it's cool and to watch these players get older and continue to improve like we have drg poking his head near a championship he's older than nest t was when nest t won his championship and like here is drg over 30 years old and he's like sneaking his way into top four and stuff and it's like oh my god like what a, what a legendary character so it's different than it used to be there's less new players coming up the europeans still definitely have some new players coming up the north americans still have some strong players that are still growing and stuff uh, I don't think we're going to get anyone that ever wins a championship that's not already known in start, in uh, GSL for the Koreans. I, I honestly don't think that. But uh, just the fact that everyone has such a long storyline with them makes it this completely different, awesome thing that, yeah, it kind of harkens back, in my opinion, to the old Warcraft 3 days. Yeah, I mean, a similar scenario for me because I came from Quake and the FPS games. And if people don't know, Quake's the same thing. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. the game's way smaller, but all the old champion guys are still there. They're, by the way, they're all still dead motivated to beat each other and try and be the best. And so it's like, in certain ways, it's not as hard because there's not as many people to beat. But by the way, try beating a guy who's been on the top for 10 years. Like, that guy's like a master. He's forgotten mm -hmm. more about the game than the newer player knows. So, like, I, th I think that's cool in its own way. So one thing I want to ask about is the ultimate version of this is, of course, the Brood War tournaments that came along the last 10 years or so so if people don't know it wasn't just that they did starcraft remastered that was part of like sort of the the, the big picture transition but they already had gone back to brood war the players that stopped playing like people like flash and bisu and those guys went back to brood war J Dong, a whole bunch as you said the people who were like at the end this is cool the people who were getting to the top of brood war and then they switched to starcraft 2 they went and back and had their chance to see if mm -hmm. they could be the best and if people don't know these players, look, they obviously didn't practice at the old team houses where you do 14 hours a day, but they were keeping in shape. They were doing practice. And these tournaments, like, give me your thoughts on this. How did this happen? Like, if you're doing GSL, there's a world where you could just go, that's pro StarCraft. I'm not going back to, like, amateur or semi-pro. But you were all involved in all these, the ASLs, the KSLs of the world. Give me your thoughts on this. Why why go and do that? And what's it been like to be in that scene? Because it feels like it has its own vibe entirely. 
Yeah, yeah. So as remaster was coming out, they were kind of gearing up at Afrika TV because Afrika TV, uh, you know, that's that's what runs StarCraft stuff. And in fact, a lot of esports uh, in in South Korea, they they run a lot of the stuff nowadays with their esports division. But they're a streaming website, and StarCraft One kind of survived uh, through streaming through some popular Brood War streamers. Um, and as as remaster was coming, they were they were gearing up to start a Star League ASL, a Freaka TV Star League. Uh, and so Tastes and I talked to them, and <laughs> excuse me, uh, you know they, you know it's always always it, it, my entire life has been this hilarious line. Tastes and I just say it to each other sometimes because it's so funny. But everyone in Korea is like, but foreigners don't like Brood War. But uh, it, like this is just always what I've heard forever is that foreigners don't like Brood War. But we convinced them to let us uh, try casting just like a, a semifinal match and a final match for the league that ran into like the, it was like a trial league to show that ASL could work, uh, that they were having just like Vance Star League or something like that. Uh, and when we did it, we had a huge amount of people tune in and people were super hyped about it. So they let us cast ASL. And yeah, I mean, that was that was an amazing thing to return to Brood War because honestly, like I didn't play any Brood War. Like I played Brood War for, you know, 12 plus hours a day for years and years. And then Starcraft 2 came out and I just dropped it. Uh, and then when Remaster came out, I started playing again, started casting again with it. Uh, and it was amazing because the scene was like, it hung on, but it wasn't in great shape. And then when it started to pick up again with ASL, oh my God, it started to grow. Everyone started coming back out of the woodwork. All these people that were doing like regular jobs or playing other games or whatever started popping back up and coming back and retiring from StarCraft 2 and going back into StarCraft 1. Uh, that happened with a lot of players. Like we already mentioned Rain and Solkey, both GSL champs, went into StarCraft 1 again. Pros, top of the world pros right now. Absolutely. Uh, Flash came back, Jadon came back, and with all these names coming back, it just grew and grew and grew. And StarCraft One is one of the most popular games in South Korea right it's now. Still played in the PC bungs, right? Yeah, it's it's been on the top ten list the entire time. Like it is still one of the <coughs> most played games in PC bungs. It's one of the most watched games on Afrika TV, which is the main streaming platform in Korea. Uh, and it's just it's crazy. Like it's, they get a ton of views on everything. The YouTube scene is huge in, yes. in Starcraft. Absolutely huge. Like a lot of the, the big pros make like these YouTube channels and like troll games and stuff. And it's just like, they have, yeah, if like, you don't know, if you're a casual fan back in the day who used to fiend for like a Bisu VOD or a flat, they're all, there's an limited amount. You will never get through all these VODs. Right? Mm. They have got, they've got their own YouTube channels and they've got like, like I say, infinite VODs. Like I, tr I used to put them on like a watch list later on YouTube, but like that gets out of control, but you'll never get through those games. There's unlimited content now for real. There really is. There really is, which actually has like, accelerated the uh, growth and the change in StarCraft 1. So the metagame, for instance, in StarCraft 1, StarCraft 1 is super healthy right now, just to put this in perspective. Like, the StarCraft 2 Korean ladder doesn't do very well. Like, it's not as active as it once was. It's not as many players and everything. StarCraft 1 is incredibly active. Like, it, if you log on at Korean evening time, you have 40,000 to 60,000 players easily logged on on the Korean server. Like, easily. And... Like, everyone's playing, everyone's watching. It takes, like, 20 seconds to queue into a ladder game. It's it's nothing at all. There's, like, there's so many active accounts every single season. It's insane. So, I mean, it, it really picked up again. And, like, the uh, the rate of improvement of people, the rate of metagame shifts is actually quicker than the Kespa days, which is insane. Because it now everyone's streaming. It's, like... In the Kespa oh, days, right. you have, let's say you have 10 So teams. you can essentially see all the practice, as it were, right? Exa Instead of being exactly. in the team. Right, that's genius. Yeah. And yeah. now that people have to make money through not oh, having a salary in winning better. tournament. Yes. Yeah, people make guidebooks. They make oh, educational right. content. And, you know, it, when you have 10 Kespa teams, maybe every team has one to two genius players. So they all those builds that those genius players are coming up with and all those ideas, you might see a hint of them in a pro league game. Yes. If the right situation arises. Right now, you have every genius player in the world that's playing is live streaming their games, playing against every other genius player. So it's like the rate of progression of strategies is so fast right now. It's a completely different world from the old Brood War. Like, <laughs> it, it's crazy. And, uh, you know, for a while there, we did have the double leagues, uh, Blizzard funded KSL for a couple years. And that was amazing having a second league in there. Uh, unfortunately, they cut that and then it's just back down to ASL. But 
it's still very, very healthy. Like Brood War is, is doing fantastically in Korea. Obviously, no interview would be complete without talking about Flash, Chris mm. B and all that. Right, here's the thing. <laughs> Flash was never my favorite player, but I was always a massive b stand. But all I'll say is this, is like, he has to win you over eventually. Like, if you don't like watching Flash play, you just don't like watching StarCraft Brood War. So the thing I want to say is this, if, if you're an old school fan who maybe watched the original Brood War in Korea, and you just know he had a, a, like a not that eventful StarCraft Two career, and you think that's it, you don't even know. This is like the wet dream, like post fucking scene at the end of the movie where like they show you like some like you know like what do you call it like I can't remember addendum or whatever afterwards right the joke is he went back to Brood War and cause obviously he had almost like we know we used to joke like he completed Starcraft Brood War even though it was a multiplayer <laughs> game he really did yeah. guys like he actually was winning so much for fun when he went back to the Brood War scene that he just started playing like random and other races and beating people with those as well like th- give me g- wax lyrical because this is like this is what we would have all speculated but everyone would go you're just being a fanboy no one could switch races. No, he did it. It's like he, it's like he was bored and just decided to actually complete StarCraft, right? Yeah. No, that's <laughs> you, that's basically correct. So Flash was already the most accomplished uh, Brood War player of all time. He was like the ultimate bone draw. In fact, he was called a level above that before ASL. Okay. So he was like already considered better than Nada, who was like the true genius that even Flash is like, well, Nada is the real genius of, of Brood War. Um, but so then Flash went to StarCraft 2 for a little bit. He did end up winning like one tournament over there, but didn't have like a GSL win. And then he came back to Brood War. And he, uh, so his season one, he wasn't in. Season two, he was in. And like he lost in the round of eight to the, at then last, the best, the best Terran player in the world. Uh, and I think he lost like two, three or something in the round of eight, if I'm recalling correctly. This was years and years and years ago. But, uh, and uh, the thing is, I'm like, okay, I, I think he's just warming up still. And then Flash won so many ASLs. They actually, Africa TV, like, there's this amazing interview that was on Team Liquid uh, where they interviewed Flash about it because he was winning so many ASLs. Like, he actually, he has, like, a winning record on ASLs, right? Like, there's one thing to have a winning match record, but there's one to be like, oh, when I enter ASL, I win more than half the time. Okay, that's (laughs) stupid. That doesn't even make sense. There's so many high-end players. But, like, he is... He was so good in winning so many of them and destroying the tournament so hard that Afrika TV started making maps that Terran couldn't win on <laughs> to the point where there's an interview on okay. Team Liquid that where like he literally was like, I wasn't feeling that much motivation, but when I see these maps, I can tell they don't want me to win. So now I'm going to really try. And like he did end up just barely losing the best Protoss versus Terran player in the world two to three in the round of eight that tournament where it was like the maps... Dude, if I recall correctly, I think no Terrans won any maps against non-Terrans except Flash. It was something like that. That's how absurd it was. It was just like the most imbalanced map season that I've ever seen. Uh, but he won. And then even after that season, he he like took a season off. Then he came back, won another season. And then he's like, you know what? It, okay, wait, I got to give you something before this. Uh, he started playing the other races a little bit. And so he was number one on ladder with his Terran. And he was number seven on ladder with his Protoss. And he had the second highest win rate of all Protoss players. Okay, so this is like, this is starting to get a little bit freaky. Then he says he's going to play random in ASL. Okay. If people don't know that's impossible, you can't do that in modern stuff. No one, no one, no one one can do that. Like when you play random, like if I play a pro gamers off race, I can, I can beat them a good amount of the time being like a 40 year old guy with four kids. Like, you know, (laughs) Uh, it's, but flash is so good that he he played random and there's all these reaction videos that were made of because what happens is the matches stream on Afrika TV and all the pro gamers restream them and kind of have their own they're like oh right. wow and like talking about it and so there's all these things of players that are of the race that Flash is playing in his random game cuz he went and he played random okay he got top 4 he got top 4 with random in ASL the hardest tournament that there is and like he's destroying people like he beat uh rush who's been to two asl finals now with every race he three out him one with each race it's like what are we even looking at here it doesn't even it doesn't even compute what what flash is capable of and there's all these clips of uh the the pros from other races just like jaws dropping they're like how does he even know that this is like secret tech. I, like, I remember Queen, AK Zero. Like, he's won like two or 
he's won two ASLs. He's been top four like three times. And he's like, how does he even know that? Like, how does he even know to do this thing in Zerg versus Zerg on this map? And like, there's there's been all these uh, clips that have been translated and stuff where people are saying like, oh man, like if Flash played my race, my race would be so much better. Like everyone, if, no matter who you ask, because I've talked to the pros and stuff, I've interviewed them in various capacities and whatnot. Every single player is like, they won't even compare themselves to Flash if you ask them to, because they're like, no, no, he's God. He's just God. He's better. No matter what race he plays, like if he takes anything seriously, he's just the best at it. So like I, I literally, I can't even do it justice. Like it, how good he is. When I see people like, what's the greatest esports player of all time? Everyone's like, oh, it's Faker. It's like, no, it's not. It's actually Flash. And then you talk about whatever you want, but it's actually, actually, actually Flash. Right, one question I had as we sort of wind down here, it goes like this. It's actually to bring it all the way back to the beginning. So when everyone goes to Korea the first time, if you're a true nerd in a game like StarCraft, maybe in the modern day League of Legends would work too, you go there because you do think it's like all the cliches, it's the mecca of esports. You go there and the streets are paved with PC bangs and they're open all night. And everyone, and, I, and by the way, this is still true to this day, you go there and as Artos said, there will be a guy playing fucking Brood War, even though you're like, dude, it's 2022. There'll be a guy right there. He, by the way, he probably wouldn't even know about esports. He might not even know anything about these players just playing brood there's always people doing it right but the problem is because people have sold the image because that was such a contrast to the west at one time like we were just nerds in bedrooms that no one knew and you had to go to a land party hundreds of miles just to meet another nerd basically that knew the game and wasn't just a casual right the problem is though there's a bit that needs shading in there which i want to get your take on as someone who lived in korea for a long time the problem is it is within the consciousness of koreans that esports exists that starcraft exists that league of legends exists but the problem is you have to be like a Mount Rushmore figure to actually be known. Like the joke is, if you go to Korea and you say I'm an esports, someone will actually just say, "Do you know him, Johan?" And you're like, "Yeah, yeah." And they'll go and they'll ask, "How's he doing?" And you go, "Dude, he retired like fucking 15 years ago." Like what? Because, but they, that's just one of the only names they know. They're going to know Faker, of course. But what people won't know is if you're like the seventh best, but they might not know you. They might not recognize your face. So how would you explain like what? To what degree is there like cultural penetration? Because and the other thing as well is. If you become a champion and you become famous from it, then your parents might be loving it and might be, but until the point you break through, they're actually sort of hating it if you do esports and it, famously you can be disowned. It can be a pretty touchy subject. So how do you explain like the full context? Because obviously everyone's heard like the pipe dream version. What's like yeah. the grounded version of what's esports like in Korea? Yeah. So, okay. When, when I first moved there, I was caught off guard from, like you said, Imyo on boxer. Uh, everyone knew him. Everyone knew him and everyone knew yellow and uh, like those two were like perfectly known it, like an old man driving a taxi. I'll tell him what I'm yes. in Korea for and he'll talk to me about boxer and yellow. So they were definitely super, super well known. I would say that uh, literally everyone between maybe 40 and 25 knows all the top Starcraft guys like talking like boxer, yellow, Nada, savior, of course, for other reasons. Uh, Flash, Jadong, Bisu. That's probably like, that's the group that basically everyone in that age group would know. And then it can like kind of bleed out for that. But it's like kind of that, that set of about 15 years or so of, of people or yeah. Yeah. That's like the group, I guess, that really knows everything about Starcraft. Uh, and then of course, if you are starting to get younger, you're going to get more League of Legends people. And of course there's blend in there too. A lot of people know about League of Legends, especially people like Faker. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people know about these things and a lot of people just know about esports existing in general. Like I've gone to restaurants with like a team liquid shirt on or something and ah, okay. the waitress will come and be like, oh, are you like a pro gamer? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm like, no. Oh no! <laughs> you know, I to, I'm like, why would she say this to this white guy in this restaurant right now? And uh, so, like, definitely, like, there is an awareness about esports everywhere, but uh, knowing the actual players and stuff, yeah, it's a little bit more specific. Except when you get to like boxer, basically, like he's, I guess, he's truly the the real legend out there. And what would you say on like the level of acceptance? Because as I said, it's a bit tricky, right? It is in a way, but then it isn't as well. Yeah, I think most uh, parents really still don't want their kids to play video games for a living. It's it's it is kind of still seen as a pipe dream. Definitely uh, more acceptable out there than I would say it was when I was growing up in America. And you know, all of us that that got good at video games, our parents thought that we were addicts and stuff. And it was 
Yeah, it was it was pretty bad, and like literally everyone thought we were dorks and nerds and losers and everything. I mean, we sort of uh, were, but we just made it in the end, right? So yeah. it all looks great now. <laughs> <laughs> Never in my own mind. I was no, always pretty okay. sure. But uh, yeah, yeah. So it definitely more accepted than that, but... I, the thing is, you see a lot of like confirmation bias, I guess, because you don't generally see people asked where their kids tried and missed, right. whereas you do see a lot of interviews and talking about parents whose kids did make it. And they're like, yeah, I'm so proud. Like, but even with them, even like I've, I've seen so many of these like uh, these little interviews where it's like, oh, this guy's won so many tournaments and they'll interview the mom or something They'd be like, oh, I was so angry. He was always skipping school to go to the PC bong. Right. So. It's not really that accepted as something that you're going to do. But at the same time, you know, there have been things like after school programs to get better at video games. Uh, so it is a thing and some parents are going to accept it and some are not. But yeah, not I think it's not as as accepted as as some people would hope or, or believe that 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 yes. vision that people have. Right, at the end of this interview, who knows, maybe we'll do another one in another 10 years. Do you have a final yeah. message or do you want to thank anyone or say hello? Uh, no, I mean, thank you. Thank you for uh, being patient. Again, this interview uh, set up uh, me, like most people in eSports, have a hard time responding to messages. Um, no, it was it was fun to kind of reminisce on this stuff. So thanks for that. Uh, as for me, like I did just move to Canada. I'm kind of focusing heavily right now uh, i'll still be commentating with tasteless and, and doing stuff but i'm i'm focusing more heavily now on working on youtube and doing my uh stream at twitch.tv forward slash artosis so if anyone wants to check out uh a 39 year old father of four try to grind up the brood war ladder and become the best player in the world uh, i'm i'm your guy especially if you like people that get angry at video games this video was kindly supported by Ahmed Haju, Hades Good, Matt Pugnacio Racula, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Butt Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Kovacevic, Ord, Pacey, Tobias Bernasconi, Tosh, Tukan, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Would you like to ask a question in one of those monthly AMAs where sometimes I roast people? Do you want teasers to find out who the guests are for upcoming shows and interviews I'm doing? Maybe you want to be part of one of those cool, lengthy esports discussions that I have. Well, if any of those perks sound tantalizing to you, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today, where? Via the Patreon link in the description box below.